Well, amen. Great job, guys. That was awesome. I have to follow that. So, yep, exactly. Thank you for feeling my pain. Appreciate that. Hey, uh, as the kids are heading out, I just want to take a second just to recognize something or someone or someones. Uh, we have a couple that are leaving us this week. Um, it's not the same leaving that you thought that I was expressing for our missions team last week when you thought that I said that this was the last time we were ever going to see them again. That's not what I meant, okay? I've gotten uh, quite a few jokes about that this past week. But uh, we have a couple that have been here for about 25 years, uh, and they are moving up towards Central Florida to be closer to some of their kids and family and all that, uh, and that is George and Linda Geisler. So you guys don't have to stand up. Would you just put your hands up? They're all the way back there in the corner. They have been very, very faithful servants for years uh, leading life groups and different ministries. George counts uh, all of the heads in here. George comes in on Tuesday morning and helps Annie count the money. Um, just I could go on and on and on with all of the things that uh, they have done here over the years and just the faithful servants that they've been. So uh, we want to wish them well. And uh, this isn't the last time that we see them. They're going to come back and visit, they promise me. But um, I just wanted to take a second and uh, just pray over them real quick and just give them a proper send-off. So let's pray. God, we just come before you right now just praising you and thanking you for George and Linda, just the awesome servants that they have been. God, this is a new chapter in their life. I know it might be exciting. It might be scary. God, I'm sure there are a ton of emotions coming with it just talking to them this morning, Lord. I could feel it already. But God, we know that you are in control. So I ask God that you would bless them. God, bless them in their health. Bless them in their new endeavors. Bless them in this uh, new place. And God, watch over them. Thank you for who they are and what they have done here at ICC and ultimately for your kingdom for all of these years. Be with them, God. Help them to feel your presence in this. And we love you, Jesus. And it's in your awesome name that we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. Very cool. Um, it's been a long week. Uh, I just got to say, um, I'll give you a little bit of news. If you were there on Wednesday night, you got the um, kind of the inside scoop in this, but we talked about it a little bit. Um, I am hoping maybe by this time tomorrow or maybe a little bit later on in the afternoon, we will be in contract to sell this property. Um, and it should be pretty solid, I'm hoping. That is something to clap about. Um, we signed a letter of intent a couple weeks ago, and we've been kind of working out some of the details and that. And so uh, please just be praying. Tuesday night is going to be a really big deal about that, not to go into all the details. Uh, you can ask me separately if you'd like, but just be praying for Tuesday night as well. Uh, big things are happening with the sale of this place, and so we're trying to get all the details straightened out in the contract. Um, as well with the building, we actually started demo over uh, in the gym. Uh, the electricians came in and they're kind of cutting out some areas so when we come in and blow walls, they can leave the electric right there. And so uh, really crazy stuff happening. So um, it's been quite a whirlwind. So, all right, you guys, um, something crazy happened this week. Did you hear about it? No? Okay, cool, good. Um, it, was a, it was actually a true story that happened this week. Um, Batman and Robin, um, they go on a camping trip, right? Uh, and after a good meal, and they got a campfire going, and they have some s'mores, they're like, all right, it's time to turn in. So they go into their tent, and they fall asleep. Well, some hours later, Batman wakes up, and he, he nudges his faithful friend Robin, and he says, hey, Robin, I want you to look up at the sky and tell me what you see. And Robin says, jeepers, Batman, because that's, of course, what he would have said. He said, jeepers, Batman, I see millions and millions of stars. And Batman says, well, what does that tell you, Robin? And Robin thinks about it for a minute. He's like, well, you know, astronomically, it tells me that there's just millions of stars and galaxies and the universe is just vast. And, um, 
Astrologically, I can observe that Saturn is in Leo because I can see them there. And chronologically, I can kind of tell, I can deduce that it's maybe like uh, 3 a.m. or so like that. You know, theologically, I can see that God is all-powerful. I mean, like, look at all these stars. Like, you know, a bunch of nothing got together and produced all this. I don't think so. So there, there is a God. And meteorologically, I can see that the sky is kind of clear. And so I think tomorrow is going to be a great day. And so he comes up with all these things, and he pauses for a second. And he says, well, why, Batman? What do you see? And Batman says, Robin, you idiot. I see that someone has stolen our tent. Here's the point. You can be a superhero, but not super smart. Okay, maybe he was smart in a different angle. But we can be heroes, we can be accomplished in some areas and have some titles and some degrees and things like that, but oftentimes on the simple things, if I can borrow my own word, um, we're not so smart in those things. So we're continuing on it in our uh, simple series. As, as Josh said earlier, our series is called Simple, and it is really intended to look at the stories in Scripture that we all know pretty well and to see if we can just find some really simple biblical truths for us to live by. And not just for us to gain information, but to find application. See, that's great. I, I, I want to give you information, but if you're leaving these doors here, leaving this church today, and you're not applying the information that we're given here today, it, it, you might as well just not hear it. And now I want you to be here, but we need to apply this information. Otherwise, Scripture says our hearts, after a while, they become hardened. If you keep hearing information over and over and over and over, but you never apply it to your life, your heart will become hardened. And that's obviously not what God wants for us. So if you've got your Bibles, turn to Judges chapter 13. That's real early on in the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. So Judges chapter 13, as you're turning there, uh, Samson. Samson is who we're talking about today. Samson is our, our big character, and everybody knows Samson. What was Samson known for? His strength, right? right? He, was, he must have been this big muscle guy, which I, I wonder. I wonder if Samson actually you know, was just huge, like kind of incredible Hulk size, or if it was just God's power would come on him when he did these crazy things. I don't know. You can ask him when you get there. But uh, Samson was kind of the superhero of the Old Testament, right? He kind of makes us think of like Hercules, right? But he had some super problems. Samson was not a guy that uh, you could look at and say, that's exactly how I want to model my life. Samson had some, some issues. He was one of the judges of Israel, but obviously didn't always make the right choices. Um, I guess one way to say it is he was strong with men, but he was weak with women. And that's kind of uh, the tag or the trademark of Samson. And although he was a man of faith, he was mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, which is the, he was this man of faith. He was not a faithful man all of the time. He wasn't faithful to his parents, as we're going to see today. He wasn't faithful to a vow that he had made, and he wasn't faithful to his God. So in the story, I want to kind of set it up so we know what's going on. We have these guys called the Philistines. Now, we know of the Philistines because we know of a very famous Philistine. What's his name? Goliath, right. Okay, so David and Goliath, we talked about them a few weeks ago. There's another very famous Philistine that we know by name. Does anybody know who it is? Okay, so I'll give you a hint, and this is a stretch for me to do this, um, but I'll, I'll sing you two words of a song. Hey there, Delilah. Okay, you guys, you fell for it. Okay, Delilah is the other Philistine that we know of, and we're not going to see her today. That's actually further on in the story. Believe me, he's got plenty of issues that are before we even get to Delilah, right? So the Philistines, they're the arch enemies of Israel. 
They migrated from the area of Greece around 1200 BC. I think they tried to invade Egypt. That didn't go too well. So they uh, kind of migrated over to the eastern side of the Mediterranean Sea. So on the west side of Israel, on the, on the south, kind of right along the coast. They inhabited five major cities, and we, we often hear about these cities in Scripture. Uh, they were Ashkelon, Ashdod, Gath, Ekron, and Gaza, which we hear a lot about Gaza nowadays, don't we? So in this time, God is raising up leaders or raising up judges to drive out the Philistines because the Philistines were oppressing them. And Samson, our boy Samson, was one of those judges, but he, he never got to reach his full potential because he kept kind of inhibiting what God wanted to do in his life. See, God has this awesome and amazing plan for every single person. And, and I, I want to just speak that over you this morning. God has an amazing, awesome plan for every single person. And you may say, well, probably not me because I, I don't feel it. I don't see it. I don't see what you know, God's doing. Maybe, just maybe, like Samson, maybe yours is like not this big, shiny, flashy, you're supposed to be this you know, big, super important person in the world's eyes, but Samson was, but Samson inhibited what God was trying to do in his life because he had these sin issues. So in Judges 13, we're just going to look at the very end of 13 and then jump into 14. Here's what happened. The angel of the Lord appears to this woman. Now, she's married, but she has no kids. She was barren. They were not able to have kids. So this angel appears and says, hey, you're going to have a child. And she's like, um, I'm not sure about that. Um, can you tell my husband this? And so then she gets him. The angel of the Lord appears again and tells them both, hey, you're going to have this very, very special child. And here's some, some things I want you to know about him. Here's some rules and a vow that I want you guys to take and for him to take and kind of sets up Samson. So the end of Judges chapter 13. Well, let me, first off, let's, let's talk about this Nazarite vow. So Samson, as most of us know, is supposed to take a Nazarite vow. Now, it's really important for us to understand what this is because we're going to see multiple times just throughout today, he violates this vow that he took. So there's three things about a Nazarite vow, and, and basically people would take this vow as like a promise to God. Some would do it for their entire lives, and some would just choose to do it for a certain period of time. So the Nazarite vow was three things. Number one, do not drink any wine or fermented drink, or even don't even eat grapes. Okay, very, very specific rule. Don't, don't eat grapes, nothing from the vine, don't drink alcohol, no strong drink, no wine, anything like that. Number two, do not come into contact with anything dead or unclean. Okay? Even if a loved one passed away, they were not allowed to go near them or attend the funeral. This was just part of the vow. So that was number two. And number three, as most of us know from the story of Samson and Delilah, never let a razor touch your head, never to cut your hair. It was a sign of, of humility or, or really humiliation, uh, to just to be long and hairy, not, not saying anything about people that grow out their hair. This was just part of the vow. Okay, so... At the end of Judges chapter 13, verse 24, it says this, the woman gave birth to a boy named Samson. He grew and the Lord blessed him and the spirit of the Lord began to stir him while he was in Mahana Dan between Zorah and Eshtal. Okay, we're two verses in and things are going really well for Samson. God's blessing him. He, he's born. He's growing up. He's a child. God's blessing him. God's spirit is starting to work in him. So far, so good, right? Well, that's it. The whole rest of the story is like just straight up downhill. Chapter 14, verse 1. This is the very next verse. Samson went, what's that word? Down, remember that. Down to Timnah. And saw there a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. 
His father and mother replied, isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among all our people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? But Samson said to his father, get her for me. She's the right one for me. A uh, little bit disrespectful there, right, to dad? Now, understand a son going to his father saying, hey, dad, I've, I, I've found the one. I've chosen her. Will you go get her for me? And the father would go and make arrangements and all that. That's how marriages were done. They were arranged marriages. So what he's saying is not out of the question. How he's saying it, you can see, is pretty disrespectful. You can see his attitude. I saw her. I want her. Go get her. This is the very first verses after God was blessing him and as God's spirit was working in him. And immediately we see his issue. Now it says, verse one, it says, Samson went down to Timnah. Now, yes, uh, geographically, he was going south and actually down. But I think it's pretty interesting that we saw in the last chapter a couple of verses that kind of have Samson blessed and God's spirit in him. And it just uses that word down. And so many times we're going to see in the passage, every time he went down to there, he was going down. It says he went down to there. And it's almost like the writer is looking at his morality, saying, you know what? He was making a poor choice to do this. His first action, okay? The first thing that we see him doing is to go to the wrong direction, to the wrong place, to look for the wrong person for the wrong reason. Now, there's four wrongs in there, guys. You would think, and the four miles that he would have to travel to go down to Timnah, you would think he would go, you know, this probably isn't the best choice. He had four miles to think about it, but he doesn't. He makes a choice to do it. Now, I want to answer a question you may have. Why couldn't he marry a Philistine woman? His, his dad's like... Ew, why are you going to the Philistines? They're ungodly people. Okay, can't you find somebody um, um, among our relatives or among somebody in the village? Can't you find a nice Jewish girl? Which, remember, I know I said relatives, remember, like second or third cousin, that was okay back then. Just want to put that out there. But he's like, couldn't you find a nice Jewish girl to marry? And, and, and you might think, wait a minute, what's going on there? But what's, what's wrong with that? Well, there's something very wrong. Why couldn't he marry a Philistine woman? Well, in the law, in Deuteronomy, Moses is giving the law to the Israelites, and he says this. He says, Israelites, you know, as you in, inhabit the land, as you go in and you conquer all of these foreign nations, here it is, Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 7, it says, do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. And we immediately we go, why? That sounds racist. That sounds intolerant. Why can't we do that? Why can't I marry somebody who I love and who loves me? And well, we know Samson didn't really love her. He lusted her, but he did not love her. God, you have no right to tell me that. You can't tell me who to marry. That's, that's a, a racist thing, God. Why would you be against what makes me happy? And I think if you were able to say that to God, God would say, would you look at the end of verse three and tell me what kind of punctuation mark that is? What is that? It's a comma, okay? It's not a period. That's not the end of it. It's not just a command and it goes. It's not even the end of the sentence. Look at verse four. For, here's the reason why, why aren't we supposed to intermarry with these people who have foreign gods? For, they will turn your children away from following me to serve other gods, and the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. Oh, okay, when you put it like that, I mean, sure, okay, now I get what you're saying. 
God isn't saying here that we're not supposed to interracially marry or anything. This was a command to the Israelites that said, hey guys, they have different gods. They believe in different things. And I will tell you what will happen if you go marry them. You will fall for their gods. They will not fall for your one true God. They will lead you away from me. It will anger me and it will destroy you. So this was a warning, not because God is against interracial marriage, not because God's a big meanie and he just wants everybody to follow rules. It's because God wants to protect because he knows what's best for us. That's a word, isn't it? If your lens at which you look through life is that God is just mean, and he is about rules, and he is about just not letting you have any fun or not letting you be happy, that's a terrible way to live. Because I can tell you, church, it's the exact opposite, that God wants the best. And guess what? I've got a whole book right here that tells us otherwise, that God loves us and he wants the absolute best for us. Here's our first point. Number one, Simple followers of Jesus don't flirt with non-God-honoring relationships. You like that word flirt? Kind of playing on Samson's issues here. I, I borrowed that word from Jake. We were talking about it this week. But it's just this idea of flirting with relationships that don't honor God. Now, I want to be really clear here. Does that mean we're not supposed to have any relationships or not supposed to have any friends with non-Christians? No, that's not what that means. Otherwise, you know what that's called when you just hang out with Christians all the time and no one else? It's called a click. Okay, don't do click, okay? But we have to be careful with those relationships because when we decide to hang out with them, a lot, or do the non christian things that they're doing, guess what happens? Just like God warned Israel, do they swing more towards our way or do we usually swing more in their direction? Option two, right? And so God warns us over and over and over through scripture. Be careful who you're hanging out with. Be careful what you're doing. Don't flirt with these non-God honoring relationships. Yes, people can be in your life and they're supposed to be in your life, but be careful how much influence you allow them to have over you because you will gravitate towards them more than they will gravitate towards you. Because God knows something about our hearts that our, our, our hearts are willing, but our flesh is weak, right? We've read that before. Proverbs 13, 20, one of my favorite verses. Walk with the wise and become wise, okay? That's a one-to-one ratio. If you hang out with wise people, you will be wise. Watch the second half of this verse. For a companion of fools becomes a fool, right? No. No. For a companion of fools suffers harm. We're no longer at a one-to-one ratio. Like if you hang out with wise people, you're going to become more wise. If you hang out with fools, really bad things happen. It's like a hundred-to-one ratio. This is a warning. This is God saying, guys, I I can't tell you enough. And, And look at all of the rest of the verses I put on there, and that's not even all of them, that warn us about who we are hanging out with, spending time with. Again, I'm not saying you strong arm every non-believer out of your life. Don't do that. But be careful what activities you're choosing to do with them, what kind of time. Just just try to pull them towards your Christian life. Try to make an influence on them. Simple followers of Jesus don't flirt with non-God-honoring relationships. So back to our verses. But Samson said to his father, get her for me. She's the right one for me. And then watch this in parentheses. This is really interesting. His parents did not know that this was from the Lord who was seeking an occasion to confront the Philistines. For at that time, they were ruling over Israel. Now, the writer here, he does something very interesting. He puts in parentheses to signify, hey, listen, this is just my thought afterwards. 
Here's the big picture thing. Yes, we've got the story, but verse four is just like, hey, hey, I want to give you a little insight about what's happening here. He's like, God was doing something here. I want everybody to see that, the writer would say. But here's the thing. This doesn't mean we get to live however we want to live and make whatever choices we want, even if they're not God-honoring. And oh, by the way, God's just going to come along and fix everything, and God's just going to use everything anyway, so we get to do whatever we want. That is very much not what this is saying here. (laughs) Here's what that means. You can let God rule over you, like, like, God, I want you to be in charge. God, I want to live by your rules. But when we don't, maybe not immediately, maybe God will, you know, give us some space. We have free will. We can make a lot of bad choices. But eventually, if you're not letting God rule over you, God will overrule you. God will step in and say, okay, enough is enough. That's it. And the choice is yours. Verse 5, here it is again. Samson went down to Timnah together with his father and mother. As they approached the vineyards of Timnah, suddenly a young lion came roaring toward him. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat. Now, hold on just for a second here. I don't even know what that means. What does it mean? Oh, okay, you know, it wasn't a lion, but I mean, you know, like, 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 was this like a, hey, what are you guys doing Friday night? Oh, you know, we're going to go out by the lake, you know, we're going to barbecue and stuff, and we're going to tear some goats, man, it's going to be awesome. Like, what, what, what do they mean to tear a young goat? I don't know. I guess it just means a comparison. If you're going to tear something, a young goat would be t- easier to tear than a lion. But look what's happening here. This lion comes up on him. Even in his sinful state, even in him going down to Timnah to do something sinful, straight against God's command in Deuteronomy, this lion comes up on him, and even still, God fills him with his spirit, and he's able to just tear this lion in two. Pretty crazy. It says, but he told neither his father nor his mother what he had done. Interesting. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and he liked her. Now, okay, if a lion rushed out at me, and God's spirit came on me, and I became strong enough to grab the lion and tear him in half, you better believe I'm bragging about that, okay? But it's really interesting. Why wouldn't he tell his parents? Maybe is there something more happening here? Verse 8. Sometime later, so it's, it gives us, this is the first time that it tells us he actually talked to her. Now, verse 8 is a little bit later. Sometime later, he went back to marry her. I guess he wanted to talk to her first before he married her. It's probably a good idea. When he went back to marry her, he turned aside to look at the lion's carcass. And in it, he saw a swarm of bees and some honey. The story just gets weirder and weirder. He scooped out the honey with his hands and ate it as he went along. When he rejoined his parents, he gave them some, and they too ate it. And here's that line again. But he did not tell them that he had taken the honey from the lion's carcass. Anybody see any red flags in these last few verses? Uh, There's just a few, right? But here's, here's probably the biggest question because here's where this started. What's a Nazarite doing in a vineyard? Why was he there in the first place? And do you realize his parents were traveling with him? But they weren't with him in the vineyard. It seems, and maybe he left a little bit early, I don't know, but it seems like they took the regular path and every time he would go down to Timnah, he would make a detour and walk through this vineyard. Now, now I get it. It doesn't say he ate any grapes, because remember, the Nazarite vow, you, you don't even eat grapes. It doesn't say that he ate grapes. I'm not trying to pin that on him, but why would he be there in the first place? 
Why would he go through and his parents didn't? This leads us to our second point. Simple followers of Jesus don't flirt with sin. See, I, I'm I, okay, we got the lion and the carcass and the eat and the honey, and that's just gross, but okay, that's a whole separate issue. Let's just pick on the whole vineyard thing for a minute. Maybe he didn't eat any grapes. Maybe he was strong enough. I don't know. Doesn't seem like it. But he was, you see how he was flirting with his sin? You see how he, he, he wanted to at least be close to it? Church, that is so dangerous. When you put yourself in a sinful, uh, just possibility, again, we are often not strong enough to withhold. <laughs> People ask me, and, and especially a lot when I was in student ministry, hey, um, is, is this thing a sin? If I go this far, is it a sin? Or, or is, that, is that really a sin? Or, or is there a Bible verse against that? Or can I do this thing and still be a Christian? Like I, I would get asked that a lot. And I think those are just terrible questions to ask because, again, we, we can talk, is it a sin? Is it not a sin? I don't know. What I do know, if I'm really trying to follow Jesus, I, I want to be as far as I can from that sin because I know I'm not strong enough. I know what happens when I get tempted. I, I, I many times don't have the strength, so I've got to set up safeguards or guardrails in my life to be careful of that. I, I, I love the passage in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 8. It's, it's a little bit of a different context, but I think the principle is the same. It says, keep falsehood and lies far from me. Just, just anything that's negative, anything that's bad, falsehood, lies, sin, evil, temptation, like keep it far from me. And, if, and don't go there now, but you can read the rest of it. It's like, because I know what's going to happen. I, I know that I won't be strong enough to fight it. And, and church, if, if we are foolish enough to flirt with sin and just to, to have it close in our lives, guess what's going to often happen? You will fall and I will fall. We've got to set up guardrails in our lives. We talk about guardrails a lot. I love preaching on guardrails. If you go out here, you go north on US 1, or you can even go south, but let's talk Whale Harbor Bridge, right? What's, what's right along the side of Whale Harbor Bridge? Guardrails. Why are they there? To keep you from getting wet, right? Okay. Um, as legend has it, I had an uncle that drove his car uh, off of, the, I think he was past the bridge, but on the north side into the water there. Um, it was late at night. There were other factors involved. We won't go there. We're in church. And, um, and he swam up back to shore. His car was out in the water, and he looked out at it, and the headlights were still on. So he swam back out and turned the headlights off. And swam out. I don't know if it's true. It makes for a great story. Okay. But the guardrails are there to keep us from going into the water. Right? Are the, are the guardrails the danger? I mean, I guess if you hit a guardrail, it's not good. Right? But the danger is actually the water. Right? Or you mountain people, the cliff. Like, like imminent death is right there. Right? That's the danger. The guardrail is there for protection. Why would we want to drive our car up and bump against that guardrail repeatedly? But we often live our lives like that. We often see how far we can go as Christians instead of just staying in the middle of the road as close as we can. Listen, listen to this quote. This is from Charles Spurgeon. Some Christians sail their boat in such a low spiritual waters that the keel scrapes on the gravel all the way to heaven instead of being carried on a flood tide. So some Christians sail their boats in such shallow spiritual water that the whole time you're dragging bottom when you could be carried just on a flood tide right into heaven. 
but you're dragging bottom the whole time. How about this quote? This one's even better. This one's from Skip Heitzig. Some believers will sail their ships so close to the lake of fire that their sails get singed. Ouch. But we do it. We do it a lot. Simple followers of Jesus don't flirt with sin. Verse 10. Now his father went down to see the woman, and there Samson held a feast as was customary for young men. Now, here's what's interesting. We, we see this progression. We, we barely even talked about the carcass and the, the eating the honey out of a dead thing and all that. Okay, there's so much happening here. But this feast, the original word means a drinking feast. Kegger, actually, is how it's translated in the Bible. I'm kidding. It's, I, I love the wave of people getting that, okay? Or you're laughing at me, that's fine too, okay? Is that kind of maybe going against the Nazarite vow to have a big drinking feast? Yeah, I would say so. He repeatedly is just making poor choices. Verse 11, when the people saw him, that's the, the, the um, Philistines, they chose 30 men to be his companions. Okay, okay. He's going down for his wedding party, right? So basically kind of this is a seven-day feast. I, I guess in our terms, this would be kind of like the bachelor party and the wedding, and it's like seven days of just big party. Samson doesn't come with an entourage, and they see him, and they're like, oh, we need to go find 30 guys to hang out with him so they could properly have this party. It's actually called the friends of the bridegroom. It's in scripture. Jesus even refers to it. Um, here's the question. Why? Why would they have to do that? Did he not have any friends of his own? Like was Samson such a loner that he doesn't have any friends? Or maybe his friends, if he did have friends, were like, dude, what you're doing is ridiculous. It's stupid, it's sinful, it dishonors God. Why are you doing this? We're gonna have no part of it. Smart friends. Verse 12. So he says this to his companions or his, to his, his 30 new friends here, the Philistines. Let me tell you a riddle, Samson said to them. If you can give me the answer within the seven days of the feast, I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. If you can't tell me the answer, you must give me 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. Tell us your riddle, they said. Let's hear it. Now, this seems like Samson was being arrogant, and he, there was probably some arrogance in there, but this was a customary thing to do. This was a little bit of a word banter back and forth, a kind of a game that they would play. It's, okay, I'm going to give you a riddle, and if you can figure out the riddle, cool, you win the prize and all of that, okay? It's just like a, like a battle of the wits, and that, that was customary back then. So verse 14, he replied, listen to his riddle, out of the eater, something to eat, out of the strong, something sweet. And it says for three days, they could not give the answer. What do you notice about the riddle? Do we have a problem with the riddle? Is there, is there something that's happening here that gives us a strong clue into his heart and his sinful heart? Number three. Simple followers of Jesus don't make fun of their sin. You see what he was doing? He made up a riddle about his sin and thought it was funny. That's how much he was not affected by his sin. Out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. He's making a joke out of his broken vow to God. Probably not a good idea, huh? I would think that probably dishonors God quite a bit. In fact, look at Proverbs 14, 9. Fools mock at sin, but among the upright there is favor. Fools mock at sin. 
Fools parade sin. Fools think their sin is fun or funny. Fools are not ashamed of their sin. Now listen, if you are not a follower of Jesus, if you do not call yourself a Christian, we're so glad you're here. This sort of and sort of does not apply to you. I am mainly talking to believers here, to Christians who say that they follow Jesus but have certain categories of sin that they are okay with. And by the way, if he wasn't supposed to go near dead things, eating honey from a carcass probably violated it, right? Yeah. So here's a question. And what we always try to do is come up with something that, okay, how do I apply this to my life? How do, okay, yep, yeah, great. I would say, I would take a raise of hands and everybody would agree Samson's being a fool, right? Samson is mocking God. He's making fun of his sin. We would all be there. But if I let you just worry about Samson, I would be doing you a disservice. So let's look a little bit internally. And we like to do this often. So here's a couple questions, a, little, a couple little exercises here. Is it possible that there is sin or, let me specify this, maybe not even sin, maybe I don't have a verse for it, but ungodly behavior, we'll call it. Maybe it's behavior like if I took a snapshot of you doing this thing and put it up here right now, you would probably sink a little bit lower in your seat. Or if uh, some practices that you were doing in business were to found out and uh, they're shady, they're, they're gray areas, but we found out about it, ooh, you probably wouldn't want anybody to know. Those are the things I'm talking about. So maybe it's not sin necessarily, but is it possible that there is sin or ungodly behavior in your life that you have justified or even celebrate? Think about it. Think about it this week. Here's another way to ask it. Are there certain categories or areas of your life where you exclude God and are happy to enjoy your sin? Have you become okay like Samson was? Like, okay, yeah, I'm Samson. I'm the judge. I got the spirit of the Lord. I'll keep my hair for now. Okay, at least I got a third of my vow going on, at least for a while. But yeah, these other two areas, God, you know what? I think that's a little too strict. God, I just think you don't want me to have fun. God, I'm not going to allow you into those areas. Are we somehow maybe making compromises? And going back to what I was saying earlier about God has an amazing plan and purpose for every single one of us, could it be possible that you are inhibiting that amazing plan and purpose because of some of the choices that you're making in your life. Here we go. Let's finish this out. It says, for three days, they could not give the answer. On the fourth day, they said to Samson's wife, coax your husband into explaining the riddle for us, or we will burn you and your father's household to death. Did you invite us here to steal our property? Then Samson's wife threw herself on him, sobbing, you hate me, you don't really love me. You've given my people a riddle, but you haven't told me the answer. I haven't even explained it to my father or mother, he replied. So why should I explain it to you? This is not going well, okay? She cried the whole seven days of the feast. So on the seventh day, he finally told her because she continued to press him. She in turn explained the riddle to her people. Before sunset on the seventh day, the men of the town said to him, what is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? Samson said to them, here it is, guys, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have solved my riddle. Now, okay. <laughs> guys, you know, you, okay. Okay. Pause for a sec. You do know it's Mother's Day next week, right? Okay, you can thank me later. Okay, now, back to the story. This marriage is not starting off on a good foot, right? Okay, first off, 
his, uh, his, his quote-unquote new friends here threatened to burn his new wife and her father and the whole family, burn them to death. She comes and throws himself on her and is crying to her and is saying, you've not told me, right? And he's whining. So then she goes and tells his riddle, and then he calls her a fat cow. That is not a great way to start a marriage, okay? I'm not really one to give a lot of marriage advice, but that's not, just don't do that, okay? Verse 19, then the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. Again, interesting how in the middle of his sin, God's Spirit still comes on him to accomplish God's will. God can rule over you or he can overrule you. Then the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. He went down to Ashkelon, which was another one of the Philistine cities, struck down 30 of their men, stripped them of everything, and gave their clothes to those who had explained the riddle. Burning with anger, he returned to his father's home, and Samson's wife was given to one of his companions who had attended him at the feast. These choices are not landing him in a great position, are they? By the way, can you think of another time in Scripture where a woman begged and pleaded someone for the answer to something and it was given up and it went bad? I'll give you a hint. The name rhymes with Samson. It was Samson, right? Samson Delilah. He, he, he gets fooled twice on this. Why? Because he had a weakness. His weakness happened to be women and a lot of other things too. But here's the thing I want us to realize. It's a big deal here. All of Samson's foolish, sinful behavior was done by a calculated choice, not by accident. And I know we can't accident our way into sin. I I, I know, but again, like he had to walk the miles down to Timnah every time, like he had time to think about it every time. Everything he did was a calculated choice. 25 miles away, he went to Ashkelon to go murder 30 people to steal their clothes. By the way, you know how you get clothes off of someone after you kill them? You touch their dead body. Over and over and over, he's making this choice, these choices, flirting with sin, choosing to sin, Choosing terrible relationships that he knows is a command to not do because they will lead him away from God. So three things. Number one, simple followers of Jesus don't flirt with non-God-honoring relationships. Number two, simple followers of Jesus don't flirt with sin. They just, it's just don't get near it. Stay far from it. And number three, Simple followers of Jesus don't make fun of their sin. You can let God rule over you, or God will overrule you eventually. Maybe not immediately, but eventually God's going to step in. God will accomplish his purpose and his plan through you or in spite of you. But oftentimes there is a cost. Let's pray. God, thank you that you do step into our lives. And God, when you see us on the wrong path, when you see us choosing sin or flirting with it, God, you step in. God, sometimes you nudge us. Sometimes you give us a lot of nudges. God, like we learned about Paul last week, just that, just why are you kicking against the goads? I've been trying to work in your life. And God, I just wonder how many of us this morning that you have been trying to work in hearts and we just keep strong arming you. We just keep thinking it's okay to have you in some areas of our life, but not in all areas. 
God, help us to desire you in every single area, every moment of our lives. God, may we shine for you. God, may we just kick out any sinful ideas, any sinful thoughts, any any sinful actions that we have. God, help us to be pure for you. God, as we keep saying, help us to empty ourselves of ourselves so that you can fill us. God, I just pray that this is not just another message that we hear, but that we truly go from here. Take this, apply it to our lives. Take time to look and see if there is any wicked way in us and lead us in the way everlasting. Thank you, God, that you convict. Thank you, God, that you convict the hearts of believers. Also, God, thank you that you convict the hearts of unbelievers. God, in this moment right now, if there are those here that do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, they would not be able to stand up and say, Jesus is my Savior. He is the Lord and Master of my life. God, would you convict those hearts right now? Help them to know, God, you are a Savior. You are a life changer, not just this life, but eternal life. And that eternal life is only through your son, Jesus. God, if there are some that do not know you, would they have the courage to seek you out? God, use us, use the church in an awesome way to further your kingdom. God, use Island Community Church in such a way that we can bless this community, not just in in, in ways that will financially help or just meeting with people, but God, that will bless them in ways that will matter in 10,000 years. Help us to be a church that sees evangelism as important that we care about the souls of people. God, work in our hearts like never before. God, we pray for this time of offering. Use it, God. Help us to be wise. Help us to be generous because you have been so generous to us. And God, we pray all of this in the awesome, most holy name of Jesus. Amen.